Is anyone ready for some boxing? Greetings and welcome to the Arizona Revival History Channel. My name is Dale Gilmore. Well, the stories about St. Paul's Episcopal Church get better and better. In our last video, we looked at their museum in honor of the prostitution industry and tombstone that supported their church. Today, we look at their very interesting pastor, Endicott Peabody. We already discovered that the cowboys of Tombstone were not ranchers, but were cattle rustlers. Well, one of Pastor Peabody's early messages was titled, The Eleventh Commandment, Thou Shalt Not Covet Thy Neighbor's Cattle. One of the area cowboys heard about the sermon and took umbrage. He threatened that he would tar and feather this new preacher for preaching that message. It so happens that Mr. Peabody was an excellent boxer, and so he suggested that if they were going to fight, they should do so on a boxing ring and charge admission, the money going to the local children's orphanage. Well, a large crowd gathered for the event, and for three rounds, the cowboy came at the preacher with fists flying, but none of his wild punches landed on Peabody. He was able to dodge, weave, and backpedal around the ring. By the fourth round, the cowboy was worn out and tired, and unfortunately dropped his arms. Peabody then delivered a roundhouse punch that knocked the cowboy out cold. The young minister had gained a whole new respect from the rough and ready Tombstonians, and the attendance at Peabody's church increased dramatically. Now, boy, you cannot make these you cannot make these things up. What a way to grow a church, and only in Tombstone. Thanks to Marshall Trimble in his True West magazine for that story. Another story of Pastor Peabody's encounter with the cowboy element is written about in a booklet by Henry Walker titled Preacher in Hell Dorado. It seems as though Endicott Peabody had preached in a nearby city named Charleston that was located over in cowboy territory near the San Pedro River. Charleston had a reputation as being a rough city, maybe even more so than Tombstone. He again had preached on the evils of cattle rustling and also used the Bible to condemn all of the drinking and carousing of the cowboys. Now that in itself showed a lot of courage on his part to preach that message in the heart of cowboy territory. Well, one of the cowboys who had been at the OK Corral that day but fled before the shooting started, named Billy Claiborne, told his friends that if Peabody came back and preached such a sermon again, he would come to church and make the preacher dance meaning shooting bullets into the floor around the preacher, making him jump and dance to avoid being struck by a bullet. When Peabody heard of the threat, he sent word back to Claiborne that he intended to return to Charleston in two weeks, and he was going to preach as he saw fit. If Mr. Claiborne would come and listen and then thought he could make Peabody dance, he would be free to try. That reply seemed to end the matter. Now this is, this is remarkable behavior for a man raised in the East, in Massachusetts, in refined society, and familiar with the halls of academia. So, who is Endica Peabody? He was born in, 18, in May of 1857 in Salem, Massachusetts. His father moved to England and moved the family with them in 1870 to take a position in a banking house there. 
Endicott, known as Cotty by his friends, attended Cheltenham College Prep School for five years. He was an outstanding athlete. After a summer vacation in Salem, Massachusetts, he returned to England and in 1880 he graduated from Trinity College, Cambridge, with a law degree. He returned to the United States where he took a position with the Boston Banking House. But he discovered that he did not like the work and so he resigned. Cotty's parents were Unitarian in their church allegiance, but Cotty had been impacted by the Church of England while living there, and after consulting friends, consulting his parents and some pastors he knew, he joined the Episcopalian Church and decided to go to the Episcopal Theological School in Cambridge, Massachusetts. He started classes in the fall of 1881 as a second year student because of his previous education. After only three months in the school in the seminary, he accepted the church call to Tombstone, Arizona. Now his call was only a short term call with the chief goal to build the Episcopal Church in Tombstone and develop the ministry in the region. Endicott Peabody admitted years later that to the average Bostonian, Tombstone, Arizona was the rottenest place you ever saw. Endicott's friend later surmised that it was that very reputation that made Mr. Peabody accept the call to this church. He also reflected later that to the average Easterner, the name Tombstone sounded pretty grim. Now, Cotty was not ordained, and so this position was to be a true test of his calling and his skills. His trip to Massachusetts, from Massachusetts to Arizona, took seven days on a train, finally arriving in Benson, Arizona. He then took the Sandy Bob straight stage from Benson to Tombstone, arriving January 29, 1882. It was cold and miserable that day, and a snowstorm was on the desert horizon that afternoon. He checked into the Grand Hotel, which was supposed to be the most ornate, beautiful hotel in Tombstone. Mr. Peabody's first impressions were not positive of this place. He said he was shown to a pretty wretched room that was too well ventilated for late January. The glass had been broken out of both outside windows and the glass was broken in the transom over the door. He was supposed to have been met that afternoon by a welcoming committee from the church but they had been detained by a card game that lasted longer than expected. They came to the hotel and, apologizing to Cotty, offered him a room in one of the men's homes for the time being. Cotty accepted the offer and spent his first weekend in the home watching a snowstorm come through Tombstone. When the storm passed, he got out and began to traipse through town. And his words were, I found that Tombstone was more of a place than I expected. In his journal, he had noted the rectangular arrangement of the streets, the fair houses, as he called them, some being two stories tall, although most were just one story. He also commented on the adobe shacks and the tents on the outskirts of town. Now I would like to examine Endicott Peabody's life in Tombstone, uh, looking at his personal life, his church life, and his role in the community of Tombstone. 
First, his personal life. Endicott Peabody fortunately was born into a family of privilege. His great-grandfather was a Salem, Massachusetts shipowner, Joseph Peabody, who made a fortune importing pepper from Sumatra. Joseph was one of the wealthiest men in the U.S. at the time of his death in 1844. Endicott's father was named Samuel Peabody, and he was a merchant and international banker who took the family to England in 1860. Endicott's first cousin was Alice Lee Roosevelt, the American wife of the President Theodore Roosevelt. Later in his life, after marrying his cousin, Endicott's grandson, also named Endicott Peabody, won All-American honors as a lineman for Harvard University football. Later, this Endicott, who was known as Chubb, became governor of Massachusetts. Now, going back to our Endicott from Tombstone, he founded Groton School, a boarding school for boys in Groton, Massachusetts. One of his more famous students was Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who has been quoted as saying, that Endicott Peabody was one of the most important influences in his life. Endicott had the privilege of officiating at the wedding of Franklin Roosevelt and his wife, Eleanor. So we asked the question, why would a young man with the background, connections, and credentials as Endicott Peabody decide to come out to the wildest town in the West in 1881, namely Tombstone, Arizona. He never really says the reason. But the opportunity presented a challenge for him, which he would never have again in his life. Plus, it was going to be a temporary position. Descriptions of Endicott say that he was well-built, muscular, athletic. One of the newspaper editors referred to Cotty's boxing prowess, made a comment in an editorial that the city of Tombstone was now be seeing a form of muscular Christianity demonstrated by the new pastor of St. Paul's Episcopal. Speaking of boxing matches, there is one more I need to include here. Cotty wanted desperately to minister to the miners around Tombstone. They, they tended to be illiterate, rough, and tumble men prone to drunkenness and fights. There was one man who obviously was the champion boxer among the region's miners. He had challenged Cotty to a fight, and so Cotty accepted him and was going to box him. The match was set up in one of Allen Street's saloons, one they said that reeked of stale beer, cigarette smoke, cheap whiskey, and floor spittoons. Now, one of Cotty's friends described Cotty as around 200 pounds with muscles hard as iron. But the miners' champion was a huge, powerful man. Many in the crowd feared that the preacher could be killed. But, after several rounds, Endicott had knocked the big man to the floor, his face swollen, black and blue, and bloody. Cotty helped the man back up and became the miners' hero, actually bringing, bringing many of the miners to church as a result. <laughs> it was just amazing. Church growth through boxing. In his private moments, Endicott was often very homesick for the East Coast and his family. After a few weeks in the job, he also confessed to feelings of inadequacy in the position. He uh, used written notes when he preached in the pulpit. When he tried to not use the notes, 
he said he noticed some of his parishioners nodding off in sleep. And so he decided to return to the notes in a more confident speaking style. He also worried in his hours in Tombstone about his deep love for the cousin, Francis Peabody, that he loved dearly, and he had doubts whether she had the same feelings toward him. So these are all emotions going through Endicott Peabody as he lived in Tombstone. Now during the mornings, he studied in preparation for his sermons or Bible studies. In the afternoon, he often entertained guests who would drop in and share a drink and a cigar with them. The evenings were filled with visiting his parishioners or staying home and writing letters to his girlfriend, Francis, or his family. Henry Walker, in his book, Preacher in Hell Dorado, writes, Peabody's success as a preacher and fundraiser can be ascribed to an outstanding personality. He was not at all snobbish, but reached out to make relationships with all types of people. Billy Breckenridge, a friend of law enforcement in Tombstone, said that Endicott was full of vim and vigor, a good mixer who soon was acquainted with all classes of society from mining owners and magnates and government officials to the miners themselves, ore handlers, teamsters, saloon keepers, and gamblers. Among the officials who admired Pastor Peabody was Wyatt Earp, and the admiration was mutual. Peabody spoke highly of Wyatt with admiration and respect in the course of his visit to Tombstone uh, some years later in 1941. He said the Earp brothers were dependable as law enforcement officers. The friendship with Wyatt Earp started early, and John Donahue suggests that as St. Paul's Church was being built, Wyatt was even up on a ladder with Cotty helping install the ceiling lamps on the sanctuary. I had asked John if Endicott understood who Wyatt Earp was, one of the most dangerous killers and gunslingers of that period, and John said, yes, he knew Wyatt's reputation, but it made no difference. They remained friends and corresponded for the rest of their lives. Pastor Peabody was caught up in the feud between the Yerps and the Cowboys, like everyone else in Tombstone. He knew of Morgan Earp's assassination and of Wyatt's vendetta ride that followed. His only comment on Morgan Earp's death was, murder and revenge has taken place in quick succession and the town is unrestful, feeling that the end will not come to this feud until one of the factions is entirely annihilated or leaves the country. Until that happens, we cannot have a town which will attract capitalists or families. Well, his church life. Cotty preached twice on Sundays, once in the morning and once in the evening. He also had a Bible study sometime during the week, I believe on Wednesday. He was a courageous fundraiser, going into the rough and tumble saloons to ask for donations towards the church's building fund. He was also faithful in visiting those in his church sometimes visiting even 15 homes in a day. And he always encouraged their giving to the church during those home visits. In the roughly six months he was in town, Cotty was able to raise the $5,000 needed to build the building, which is still standing in Tombstone. Comments from his contemporaries were that his preaching was filled with sincere enthusiasm his messages were relevant and interesting, and the church was always decorated with beautiful flowers. He also developed a choir, though quite small, 
consisting of only four people, all of whom were men, but they must have sung well as people of the time enjoyed the music immensely. We know he preached against cattle wrestling. He also preached against gambling, having the audacity to go into the saloons prior to that sermon, inviting gamblers to church to hear his sermon against gambling. Now, did he preach against illicit sex and prostitution? We don't know. I was incorrect in my last video saying that prostitutes were not allowed to attend services. Since that video, I have read further reports that ladies of the evening were allowed north of Fremont Avenue or on the so-called good side of town. What is disturbing, however, <laughs> is that they would leave the Sunday service and head immediately back to the saloons to drum up clients for their bordello and their brothel. Did Cotty preach about salvation and people coming into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Or did he focus on the moral truths of the Bible? I do not know of any copies of his messages that remain, but we do know that Pastor Peabody was an interesting speaker and awakened an interest in the Bible and Bible study at Tubestone in those years. I have not read any thing written about any prayer meetings or church events that focused on prayer either. And I'm assuming the prayers prayed on Sunday were pre-written and part of the Episcopal handbook. And finally, thirdly, his involvement in city life. Cotty's boxing skills served to bring attention to him and St. Paul's Church. But Endicott also began the first baseball team in Tombstone. He was a very good baseball player and developed a very competitive team. They began to play teams from Bisbee and Tucson in the years that followed. Always much betting seemed to surround these games, and victories helped develop a sense of civic pride. One Tombstone newspaper wrote of Endicott Peabody, Well, we've got a parson who doesn't flirt with the girls, who doesn't drink behind the door, and when it comes to baseball, he's a daisy. Now, in 1880 parlance, daisy meant excellent quality. Regarding other sporting events in Tombstone, Cotty became the referee or umpire of choice. His umpiring in the athletic contests in town was always respected. He did not take sides, and his calls usually were accurate. At least it did not result in fistfights or killings, which was true of games sometimes umpired by others. Now, when Cotty left Tombstone in July of 1882 to return to Massachusetts, his leaving was almost universally deplored. The Episcopal Church bishop said that Tombstone had made the greatest progress towards gaining self-support of any church in his jurisdiction. He went on to say the reason for that was the earnestness, the modesty, and the tact of Mr. Endicott Peabody. I regret very much to lose him. His friend George Parsons said, we will not easily fill Peabody's place. Cotty returned to Tombstone for a visit about 40 years later, in 1921. When he preached in his old church that weekend, it is to his credit that parishioners from all over Arizona and the West Coast returned to hear him preach that Sunday. Upon returning to Massachusetts, Endicott 
went back to the Episcopal Theological School, and he graduated in the spring of 1884, was ordained in 1885, and married his cousin Franny in June of that year also. Seems like she did have feelings for him. Over the years, he and Franny had six children, one boy and five girls. Also in 1885, Endicott, along with two of his colleagues, established Groton School for Boys in Groton, Massachusetts. It was a boarding school near Boston. The curriculum that Peabody envisioned was targeted to boys, primarily boys from upper-class families, whom Peabody wished to steer towards moral leadership and philanthropy. Now, Indica Peabody served as the school's headmaster from 1885 to 1940, a total of 55 years. His students included the four sons of Teddy Roosevelt, as well as his cousin, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Endicott died in November, on November 17, 1944, and is buried in Groton, Massachusetts. He was 87 years old. Well, this concludes my look at Tombstone Churches and life in the city during the years 1880 to 1882. I do not think all of my answers about church life in that period have been answered. It does appear that Pastor Endicott Peabody did address some sins in a rather open fashion. On the one hand, I find nowhere, though, that he preached against sexual sin and prostitution. And I don't think I read anywhere where the word prayer was employed. That's bothersome. There either was vast ignorance of the spiritual weapons available to influence and change tombstone towards the positive, or his understanding of the gospel of Jesus Christ was a series of doctrines to be embraced, and that was all. I would end today by encouraging prayer for Tombstone. I believe a spiritual revival is coming, and I'd love to see Tombstone deeply impacted by a fresh move of the Holy Spirit here in Arizona. Well, I'd like to hear from you. Write comments below or send them to our email address, Arizona Revival History at gmail.com, Arizona Revival History at gmail.com. I invite you to click like if you like this program or to subscribe if you want to get notice of new videos. My name is Dale Gilmore, and I pray that God would meet every need you have according to his riches and glory. Until next time.